Preface of The Nativity of Our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Nativity of Our Lord Jesus Christ from the Meditations of Anne Catherine Emerick. Translated by George Richardson. Preface. As I am now more than 86 years old, I don't think it probable that I shall attempt any more translation of Sister Emmerich's revelations. I wish, therefore, to say a few words about dear Sister Emmerich before departing. I have read through her revelations several times during the last 60 years, and I have more frequently read through the New Testament, and have never been able to detect the slightest opposition between them. The discovery of the house of the Blessed Virgin near Ephesus, exactly corresponding with Sister Emmerich's description of it, has given a new impetus to the desire to read her revelations. This discovery will lead, no doubt, in God's good time, to the finding of Our Lady's tomb, the scene of her glorious assumption. The statements made by Sister Emmerich must be regarded only as those of a devout nun, and must not be confounded with statements of fact supported by the testimony of the Church. George Richardson, Alma Park, Levin May, 1899 End of the Preface Part 1 of The Nativity of Our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Nativity of Our Lord Jesus Christ from the Meditations of Anne Catherine Emmerich. Translated by George Richardson. Part 1. The Marriage of the Blessed Virgin The Holy Virgin lived in the temple with several other virgins under the charge of pious matrons. These virgins were occupied with embroidery and other works of the same kind for the hangings of the temple and the vestments of the priests. They were also employed in washing the vestments and in other matters pertaining to the divine worship. They had little cells whence they had a view of the interior of the temple, and where they prayed and meditated. When they were arrived at a marriageable age, they married. Their parents had given them entirely to God in conducting them to the temple. And there was among the most pious of the Israelites a secret presentiment that one of these marriages would be the cause some day of the coming of the Messiah. The Blessed Virgin being fourteen years old, and about soon to leave the temple and be married, with seven other young girls, I saw St. Anne come to visit her. Joachim was no longer living. When they informed Mary that she must leave the temple and be married, I saw her deeply moved, declared to a priest that she had no desire to quit the temple, that she was consecrated to God alone, and had no inclination for marriage but they told her she must take a husband. I saw her afterwards in her oratory pray to God with fervor. I remember also that being very thirsty, she descended with her little pitcher to draw water from a fountain or reservoir, and that there, without any visible apparition, she heard a voice that consoled and fortified her, at the same time making known to her that she must consent to be married. I saw also a very old priest who was unable to walk. It might be the high priest. He was carried by other priests into the Holy of Holies. And, whilst he lit the sacrifice of incense, he read some prayers from a roll of parchment placed on a kind of pulpit. I saw him in an ecstasy. He had a vision, and his finger was placed on the following passage out of the prophet Isaiah, which was written on the roll. A branch shall arise from the root of Jesse, and a flower shall spring from this root. Isaiah 4, verse 1. When the old priest returned to himself, he read this passage and knew something by this. I then saw that messengers were sent to all parts of the country, and that they convoked to the temple all the men of the race of David who were unmarried. When many of them were assembled in the temple in their festival dress, they were presented to the Blessed Virgin. 
I then saw the high priest, obedient to an interior impulse which he had received, present branches to each of these present, and tell them to mark each one a branch with his name, and hold it in his hand during the prayer and sacrifice. When they had done as required, the branches were taken from them and placed upon an altar before the Holy of Holies. And it was announced to them that he among them whose branch should flourish was designed by the Lord to be the husband of Mary of Nazareth. Whilst the branches were before the Holy of Holies, they continued the sacrifice and the prayer. Then after the time fixed, they gave back the branches and announced to them that no one of them was designed by God to become the husband of this virgin. Afterwards, the priests of the temple sought afresh in the registers of families, if no other descendant of David was in existence whom they had overlooked. As they there found an indication of six brothers of Bethlehem, of whom one was unknown and had been absent for a long time, they inquired after the abode of Joseph, and discovered him a short distance from Samaria, in a place situated near a small river, where he dwelt on the margin of the water, working for a master carpenter. On the order of the high priest, Joseph came to Jerusalem and presented himself at the temple. They made him also hold in his hand a branch while they prayed and offered sacrifice. As he was offering to place it on the altar before the Holy of Holies, there came out from it a white flower like a lily, and a luminous apparition descended upon him. It was as if he had received the Holy Ghost. They knew then that St. Joseph was the man designed by God to be the spouse of the Blessed Virgin, and the priest presented him to Mary in the presence of her mother. Mary, resigned to the will of God, humbly accepted him as her spouse, for she knew that everything is possible with God, who had received her vow of belonging only to him. Concerning the Marriage and the Wedding Dress of Mary and Joseph Sister Emeric, in her daily visions on the ministry of our Lord, saw on Monday, the 24th of September, 1821, Jesus teaching in the synagogue of Gophna, and there staying with the family of a chief of the synagogue, a relative of Joachim. She heard on this occasion two widows, daughters of this man, conversing together on the marriage of the parents of Jesus, at which they had assisted in their youth, with other relatives, and she communicated what follows. As the two widows referred in their conversation to the marriage of Mary and Joseph, I saw a picture of the marriage, and I was struck with the beauty of the nuptial dress of the Holy Virgin. The marriage of Mary and Joseph, which was kept up for seven or eight days, was celebrated at Jerusalem, in a house near Mount Sion, which was frequently let for similar occasions. Besides the witnesses and companions of Mary in the school of the temple, there were many relatives of Anne and Joachim, amongst others a family of Gophna, with two daughters. The marriage was solemn and sumptuous. Many lambs were killed and offered in sacrifice. I saw Mary very distinctly in her bridal dress. She had a very large gown, open in front, with large sleeves. This gown had a blue ground strewn with red, white, and yellow roses, intermingled with green leaves, like the rich chasubles of ancient times. The lower border was trimmed with fringe and tassels. Over her dress she wore a mantle of celestial blue, which had the appearance of a large sheet. Besides this mantle, the Jewish women frequently carry also on certain occasions a species of mourning mantle with sleeves. The mantle of Mary fell back over her shoulders and terminated in a train. She carried in her left hand a small crown of red and white roses made of silk. In her right hand she held, in form of a scepter, a beautiful gilt candlestick without a foot, surmounted by a little dish where something was burning, which produced a white flame. The virgins of the temple arranged the hair of Mary. Many of them were engaged at it, and it was done in an incredibly short time. Anne had brought the wedding dress, and Mary, in her humility, would not consent to wear it after her marriage. Her hair was fastened round her head, and they put on her a white veil, which hung below her shoulders, and a crown was placed over this veil. The Holy Virgin had an abundance of hair of light gold color, her eyebrows black and elevated, 
large eyes, habitually cast down, with long black eyelashes, a nose of a beautiful form, rather long, a noble and graceful mouth, and a slender chin. She was of middle stature. She walked, clad in her rich costume, with much grace, elegance, and gravity. She afterwards put on for her marriage another dress, less splendid, of which I possess a small piece among my relics. She wore this striped dress at Cana, and on other solemn occasions. She sometimes put on her marriage dress to go to the temple. There were rich people who changed their dress three or four times for their marriage. In her dress of ceremony, Mary rather resembled certain illustrious ladies of later times. For instance, the Empress St. Helen, and even St. Cunagonda, though she differed from them in the cloak which Jewish women usually wear, and which more resembled that of the Roman ladies. There were at Sion, in the neighborhood of the Senecal, a certain number of women who prepared beautiful stuffs, all kinds, which I remarked in consequence of these dresses. Joseph had a long and very wide robe of blue color. The sleeves, which were very large, were fastened at the side with strings. Round the neck he wore a kind of brown collar, or rather a large stole, and over his breast two white bands hung down. I have seen all the ceremonies of the marriage of St. Joseph and the Blessed Virgin, the marriage feast, and other solemnities. Mary's Marriage Ring On the 29th of July, 1821, Sister Emeric had a vision on the grave clothes of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the wonderful prints of his body, which show themselves miraculously upon the winding sheet in which he had been wrapped. On this occasion she found herself conducted to several places, where these holy relics were found, some religiously preserved, others forgotten by men and honored only by the angels and certain holy souls. She believed that she saw preserved in one of these places the marriage ring of the Blessed Virgin, and she then related as follows. I have seen the marriage ring of the Blessed Virgin. It is neither silver nor gold nor any other metal. It is of a dark color with changing reflections. It is not a small circle. It is as thick and as wide as a finger. I saw it quite smooth and still, as if encrusted with small regular triangles where there were letters. I saw it kept under several locks in a beautiful church. There were some pious people who, before celebrating their marriage, touched their marriage rings with it. On the 21st of August, 1821, she said, I have learned during the last few days many details relative to the history of the marriage ring of Mary, but I cannot relate them all in order. I have seen today a festival in a church in Italy where it is found. It is exposed in a kind of monstrance, which was placed above the tabernacle. There was there a large altar, richly decorated, with many ornaments in silver. I saw that they touched the monstrance with several rings. I saw during the festival, on the two sides of the ring, Mary and Joseph appear in their bridal dresses. It seems to me that St. Joseph placed the ring on the finger of the Blessed Virgin. I saw the ring all luminous and as if in motion. Footnote. When the writer wrote this on the 4th of August, 1821, he could not understand why the sister had this vision precisely on the 3rd of August. He was much surprised many years afterwards, when he read in a Latin writing on the ring of the Blessed Virgin, preserved in Perose, that they exhibited this ring to the people on the 3rd of August, of which probably neither he nor the sister knew anything. He found this information on page 39 of the writing entitled, Of the Marriage Ring of the Blessed Virgin, Mother of God, Religiously Preserved at Perose, the commentator of S. B. Lauris of Perouse. 1626. End footnote. When the marriage was finished, Anne returned to Nazareth, and Mary departed also, in company of several virgins who had quitted the temple at the same time as she did. I do not know how far these virgins conducted her on her way. The first place at which they stayed to pass the night was at the school of the Levites at Betharon. Many made the journey on foot. Joseph, after the marriage, went to Bethlehem to regulate some family affairs. It was not until later that he returned to Nazareth. From the return of Mary to the Annunciation 
Before relating the vision of the Annunciation, the sister communicated two fragments of previous visions, of which we can only offer a conjectural explanation. Being very feeble through the effects of a serious illness, she related what follows some time after the marriage of the Blessed Virgin and St. Joseph. There was a festival in the house of St. Anne, and some children assembled with Joseph and Mary, round a table on which were placed some glasses. The Blessed Virgin had a striped mantle with red, blue, and white flowers, as we see on ancient chasubles. She wore a transparent veil, and above this a black veil. This feat appeared to be connected with the marriage festivities. She related no more on this subject, and we can only suppose that this repast took place when the Blessed Virgin left her mother after the arrival of St. Joseph, and retired with him into the house at Nazareth. The following day she related what follows. Tonight in my contemplation I sought for the Blessed Virgin, and my conductor led me into the house of St. Anne, every part of which I recognized. I found there neither Joseph nor Mary. I saw St. Anne preparing to go to Nazareth, where the Holy Family was now residing. She carried under her arm a packet which she was taking to Mary. She went to Nazareth, crossing a plain and a little wood placed on an eminence. I went there also. The house of St. Joseph was not far from the gate of the city. It was not so large as the house of St. Anne. A square well, which was down some steps, was in the neighborhood, and there was before the house a small square court. I saw St. Anne visit the Blessed Virgin, to whom she gave what she had brought with her. I saw Mary weep very much, and for some time accompany her mother who was returning to her home. I saw St. Joseph in front of the house in a secluded spot. We may gather from these fragments that Anne visited for the first time her daughter at Nazareth, and brought her a present. Mary, who now lived by herself, separated from her well-beloved mother, shed tears of tenderness in parting from her. The Annunciation On the 25th of March, 1821, the sister said, I saw the Blessed Virgin soon after her marriage, in the house of Joseph at Nazareth, to which my guide conducted me. Joseph had departed with two asses. I think it was to fetch something that he had inherited, or to bring the tools of his trade. He seemed to me still on his journey. Besides the Blessed Virgin and two young women of her own age, who had been, I believe, her companions in the temple, I saw in the house St. Anne with the widow, her relative, who was in her service, and who later on followed her to Bethlehem after the birth of Jesus. St. Anne had renewed everything in the house. I saw the four women walking about in the house, and then they walked together in the court. Towards evening I saw them re-enter, and pray standing round a little round table, after which they ate some herbs which had been brought there. They separated afterwards. St. Anne still went about here and there in the house, like the mother of a family engaged in her duties. The two young persons went into their separate chambers, and Mary also retired into her own. The chamber of the Blessed Virgin was in the back of the house, near the fireplace. It was reached by three steps, for the ground at this part of the house was higher than the rest, and on a rocky foundation. Opposite the door the chamber was round, and in this circular part, which was separated by a partition of the height of a man, was the bed of the Blessed Virgin rolled up. The walls of the chamber were covered to a certain height with a kind of inlaid work, made of pieces of wood, of different colors. The ceiling was formed by parallel joists, the spaces between which were filled with wicker work, ornamented with figures of stars. I was conducted into this chamber by the young man of shining appearance who always accompanies me. Footnote, her guardian angel. End footnote. And I will relate what I saw as well as such a wretched person as I am can do. The Blessed Virgin on entering dressed herself behind the screen of her bed in a long robe of white wool with a large belt and covered her head with a veil of light yellow. In the meantime, the servant entered with a light, lighted a lamp with several branches which hung from the ceiling, and retired. The Blessed Virgin then took a little low table which stood against the wall, and placed it in the middle of her chamber. 
It was covered with a red and blue cloth, in the middle of which a figure was embroidered. I cannot say whether it was a letter or an ornament. A roll of parchment, written upon, was on the table. The Blessed Virgin having arranged it, between the place of her bed and the door, on a spot where the floor was covered with a carpet, placed before it a small round cushion on which to kneel. She then knelt down, her two hands leaning upon the table. The door of the chamber was in front of her, to the right. She turned her back to her couch. Mary let down the veil over her face, and joined her hands before her breast, but without crossing the fingers. I saw her pray for a long time with great ardor, her face turned towards heaven. She invoked the redemption, the coming of the king promised to the people of Israel, and she asked also to have some part in this coming. She remained a long time on her knees transported in ecstasy. She then bent her head over her breast. Then from the ceiling of the chamber descended, on her right side, in a slightly oblique direction, such a mass of light that I was obliged to turn myself towards the court, where the door was placed. I saw then in this light a resplendent young man, with white flowing hair, descend before her, through the air. It was the angel Gabriel. He spoke to her, and I saw the words come from his mouth like letters of fire. I read them, and understood them. Mary slightly turned her veiled head to the right side. Notwithstanding in her modesty, she did not look at him. The angel continued to speak. Mary turned her face to one side, as if in obedience to an order, slightly raised her veil, and replied. The angel spoke again. Mary completely raised her veil, looked at the angel, and pronounced the sacred words. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. The Blessed Virgin was in a profound ecstasy. The chamber was full of light. I saw no more the light of the lamp which was burning, neither did I see the ceiling of the room. Heaven appeared to be open. My observation followed the luminous way above the angel. I saw at the extremity of this river of light the Holy Trinity. It was like a luminous triangle, whose rays reciprocally penetrated each other. I then recognized what we must adore, but can never express, the omnipotent God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and yet one only God Almighty. When the Holy Virgin had said, Be it done to me according to thy word, I saw a winged apparition of the Holy Spirit, which, however, had not completely the ordinary representation under the form of a dove. The head had something like a human face, the light spread out on both sides like wings, and I saw come from it, as it were, three luminous streams towards the right side of the Blessed Virgin, where they reunited. Then this light penetrated her right side. The Blessed Virgin herself became luminous, as if transparent. It seemed as if everything that was opaque in her retired before this light, as night before the day. She was at this moment so inundated with light, that nothing in her appeared obscure or opaque. She was resplendent and as if completely illuminated. I afterwards saw the angel disappear the luminous ray from which he had emerged retired. It was as if heaven drew it in, and caused to re-enter into itself this flood of light. After the disappearance of the angel, I saw the Blessed Virgin in a profound ecstasy, and altogether recollected in herself. I saw that she knew and adored the incarnation of the Savior in herself, where he was a small luminous human body, completely formed, and provided with all his members. Here at Nazareth everything is completely otherwise than at Jerusalem. At Jerusalem the women have to remain in the vestibule. They cannot enter into the temple. Priests only have access to the sanctuary. But at Nazareth it is a virgin who is herself the temple. The Holy of Holies is within her, the high priest is within her, and she is alone with him. How touching and wonderful is this! and yet how simple and natural. The words of David in the 45th Psalm are accomplished. God is in the midst thereof, his tabernacle, and it shall not be moved. It was a little past midnight when I saw this mystery. After some time, St. Anne entered into Mary's room with the other women. A marvelous movement in nature had awakened them. 
a luminous cloud had passed over the house. When they saw the Blessed Virgin on her knees under the lamp, transported in ecstasy and prayer, they respectfully retired. In contemplating this night, the mystery of the Incarnation, I was also instructed in many other things, and received an interior knowledge of what had been accomplished. I learned why the Redeemer would remain nine months in the womb of his mother and become an infant, why he had not desired to come into the world a man, like our first father, and show himself in all his beauty, like Adam coming from the hands of his Creator. But I cannot clearly explain this. That which I now understand is that he wished to sanctify again the conception and the birth of men, which had been so much degraded by original sin. If Mary became his mother, and that he did not come sooner, was that she alone was what no creature was before or after her, the pure vessel of grace which God had promised to men, and in whom he would become man, to pay the debt of human nature by means of the superabundant merits of his passion. The Blessed Virgin was the perfectly pure flower of the human race, unfolded in the fullness of time. All the children of God amongst men, all those who since the beginning had labored in the work of their sanctification, had contributed to his coming. She was the only pure gold of the earth. She alone was the pure and spotless portion of the flesh and blood of the whole human race, who, prepared, purified, gathered, and consecrated through all the generations of her ancestors, conducted, protected, and fortified under the regulations of the law of Moses, was finally produced as the fullness of grace. She was predestined in eternity, and has appeared in time as the mother of the eternal. The Blessed Virgin was a little more than fourteen at the time of the Incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ appeared at the age of thirty-three years, and three times six weeks. I say three times six, because the figure six was shown to me at this instant, but repeated three times. When Joseph returned to Nazareth with the Blessed Virgin, after her visit to her cousin Elizabeth, he saw by her figure that she was in saint. He was then assailed with all sorts of troubles and doubts, for he knew nothing of the visit of the angel to Mary. Soon after his marriage, he had gone to Bethlehem on some family affairs. Mary in the meantime had returned to Nazareth with her parents and some companions. The angelic salutation had taken place before the return of Joseph to Nazareth. Mary in her timid humility had kept to herself the secret of God. Joseph, full of trouble and anxiety, did not attempt to learn anything from without, but struggled in silence against his doubts. The Blessed Virgin, who had perceived this, at once was grave and pensive, which increased still more the anxiety of Joseph. When they had arrived at Nazareth, I saw that the Blessed Virgin did not go at once into the house with St. Joseph. She remained two days with a family connected with her own. They were the parents of the disciple Parmenas, who was not then born, and who afterwards became one of the seven deacons in the first community of Christians at Jerusalem. These people were allied to the Holy Family. The mother was the sister of the third husband of Mary Cleophas, who was the father of Simeon, bishop of Jerusalem. They had a house and garden at Nazareth. They were also allied to the Holy Family on the side of Elizabeth. I saw the Blessed Virgin remain some time with them before returning to Joseph's house. But his trouble increased to such an extent, that when Mary desired to return to his house, he had formed the intention of leaving it and going away secretly. Whilst he was meditating on this project, an angel appeared to him in a dream and consoled him. End of Part 1